Uh, Celine will say a bit more about that, but uh, we are in the middle of uh, an extraordinary uh, emergency which has been overshadowed in the last couple of years by the by the COVID and the global pandemic, uh, which has actually also uh, in a way showed us what governments and citizens are capable of doing in response to an emergency that they then legally recognize and politically are required to act on. So a little bit of, um, uh, by way of background about wh where I'm sort of coming from. As I said, I'm um, a trustee at Julie's Bicycle. Um, I'm also um, uh, someone who's uh, negotiated with uh, and, and for vulnerable developing countries in the climate negotiations in these large UN summits that have been taking place since 1991. I've had the pleasure of doing that with one of the speakers today, Salim, who has been working tirelessly on uh, these issues. Um, and uh, today we're uh, focusing uh, on, on uh, uh, the, the one of the elements that we're focusing on is, um, as I said, loss and damage, justice and fairness, uh, decarbonization, nature, circularity and a regenerative economy. These are the big picture themes that uh, Julie's Bicycle is going to be focusing on. So over the next hour and uh, 15 minutes or so, we're going to hear from Professor Salim ul who will give us a short introduction to this particular topic of loss and damage. And then we'll be followed by Anna Santamauro, uh, who will be talking about creative responses from the arts uh, uh, catalyst and Andrea Carmen, who will talk a little about culture cultural heritage as well. So we'll have a short discussion and lots of time for questions and answers. Um, and please feel free to uh, start uh, introducing yourselves in the chat function. Please feel welcome to uh, put in questions uh, in the question and answer uh, uh, tab. And please also feel free to vent, comment, uh, give us your ideas and suggestions uh, forward. Um, there are live captions available, which you can access using the CC button uh, in your Zoom controls. Um, and uh, your, let me just, a bit of housekeeping, your videos are switched off and muted by default, um, but uh, we'll be monitoring the, the, the questions and answers box. And towards the end of the session, it's possible that I may be able to uh, unmute and ask uh, some of you to, to step up. Um, and just finally, if you have any difficulties, uh, Farah Ahmed from the JV team is also online to support you. So with that, um, uh, I think I've covered all the bits that I needed to. Um, I think the session is being live streamed um, and uh, to keep the conversation going uh, uh, during this session and outside of it, please use the hashtag uh, creative climate justice and we'll put that in the chat function as well. So um, with that, I'm really pleased to introduce um, Professor Salim al Huck, who was recently and rightly, you know, given an OBE in the New Year's list. I'm absolutely delighted that he's received recognition in, in the UK uh, for his amazing and outstanding work in supporting uh, uh, climate uh, as an issue especially from the viewpoint of vulnerable countries. Uh, Salim is the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICCCAD. Um, and he's also a professor at the Independent University of Bangladesh. So uh, for many years, he ran the climate change program at IAED based in the UK. So uh, over to you, Salim. I know that we've also worked together uh, in your capacity as chair of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which is a a grouping of 55 now uh, the vulnerable developing countries and you are the person who's best placed to give us the long overview as well as the big picture on loss and damage so over to you Salim I think you have about 10 minutes or so. Sure. Thank you very much Fahana thank you very much for <coughs> Julie's Bicycle for inviting me uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, and uh, speak about this issue so let me uh, begin by uh, starting with sort of first principles, as it were, about climate change, which I'm sure everybody is aware of. It's a problem, human-induced climate change is a problem uh, created by the emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution. And uh, we need, and it raises global temperature 
uh, uh, significantly. It's already raised temperature over one degree, and we want to keep it below 1.5 degrees, which is a dangerous threshold. Um, and in order to do that, there are several strategies that we have adopted over the years. The first one is what we call mitigation. So climate jargon, mitigation means reducing emissions that cause the problem. And every country has now agreed to reduce their emissions. They're not doing enough of it. We need to do a lot more. But the reducing of emissions through mitigation is the first strategy to make sure that the temperature doesn't go much higher than it already has. Uh, the second strategy that came after we realized that the temperature is already beginning to go up and uh, the impacts are likely to happen, uh, whether we like it or not, the emission reductions aren't happening fast enough, and therefore we now have to adapt uh, to those uh, potential impacts of climate change. And so we've been investing a lot in uh, preparing, adapting, preparing adaptation plans, etc., uh, to deal with it. But now we have actually segued, uh, and I would say it, the last year, 2021, was the uh, tipping point when the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 1, the scientists, brought out their report on the 9th of August last year, where they said for the first time in 30 years that they have unequivocal evidence that the temperature that has already risen due to human-induced climate change is now causing impacts adverse impacts that can be attributed to the enhanced temperature that has been created. And these impacts are happening all over the world. They've been happening in the developing countries for some years now, but they're also happening in the developed countries. And in fact, uh, you know, we just had a storm up in Scotland that killed two people, and we have a snow bomb going on in northeastern US in Boston uh, that is uh, paralyzing uh, the, the communities there. Every, every part of the world, every country in the world is seeing these kinds of uh, severe weather events, unprecedentedly severe weather events that can be reasonably attributed to human-induced climate change. So as these impacts that are attributable to human-induced climate change start coming, uh, uh, becoming a reality, we now suffer losses and damages due to them. And the term loss and damage is a uh, is not a highly uh, uh, well-defined term because in the ne negotiations we often use uh, terms that aren't defined so that people can uh, uh, define it for their own convenience. But a rough uh, operational definition of what we mean by the term loss and damage is loss referring to uh, things that are lost uh, uh, beyond recovery. So a human life lost is not going to come back. A species lost is not going to come back. An ecosystem lost is not going to come back, no matter how much money uh, we might uh, provide to the victims. Uh, the, the loss is irreparable and irrecoverable. Uh, damage, on the other hand, refers to things that can be uh, uh, repaired, a house that's damaged can be repaired, a road that's damaged can be repaired, an embankment that's damaged can be repaired, uh, a crop that's lost can be uh, compensated for. So uh, damage is things that can be repaired if you have enough uh, to do that, uh, and uh, that is something that comes into play. The other uh, aspect of loss and damage to keep in mind is that it is actually a euphemism for uh, another set of terms which are taboo terms and which are not allowed uh, to be discussed in the UNFCC, which are liability and compensation. Uh, the developed countries and particularly the United States of America is extremely allergic to any hint of liability and compensation. And so loss and damage is a euphemism uh, for talking about uh, potential liability and compensation. Um, and, and this uh, is something that the U.S. government in particular has been very, very allergic to and, and insistent on. And uh, in the uh, COP26 decision where the developing countries asked for a Glasgow facility on finance for loss and damage, the U.S. Uh, downgraded that to a, a dialogue instead of a finance facility. They just said a dialogue for two years. Uh, so just talk, talk, talk more and, and not do anything about it. But unfortunately, uh, the impacts of climate change are already happening. They're happening everywhere, including in the United States of America and in Europe and so on. So this is an unavoidable topic. We're all going to have to deal with it. And the framing of this now, in my view, is a much wider issue for all of us, everybody on the planet to uh, understand under a ju climate justice 
or climate injustice uh, framing. It's about rich people in rich countries mostly, but rich people everywhere, including in my country, Bangladesh, um, causing the problem and poor people everywhere, but mostly in poor countries, but even poor people in rich countries are being affected by the impacts of uh, climate change. And that's just not right. That's wrong. That's immoral. It's uh, any, uh, whatever religion you belong to, or even if you're an atheist, you will uh, accept that that's a, uh, an injustice that is wrong, that should be addressed and should not be allowed to happen. And it's in that context that I think the issue of loss and damage, which sounds like a very esoteric subject that not many people understand, needs to be uh, conveyed to the wider public. And that's where you know artists like yourselves and people working in this domain have a big, big role to play uh, in terms of explaining it in a manner that people can understand. Uh, people can then not only understand the problem, but also figure out ways in which they can engage in addressing the problem, in solving the problem uh, in their own way, in their own place, in their own location, and linking up with like-minded uh, people uh, that they might be able to join forces with. We really do need everybody on deck. This is a global problem that requires global solutions. And uh, unfortunately, uh, our leaders of the nearly 200 countries that come together every year at the COP, the leaders have let us down. They, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. They, they promised in Paris to keep temperature below 1.5, but they're not on track to do that. Uh, they promised to discuss loss and damage, but they're not on track to do that. So they, they've been promising many things, but they have not been delivering. So I think that it's time for us as citizens to be the ones to step up. And we need to be proactive in doing things ourselves, wherever we are at the local level, but then also connecting to the national level in national policy terms at the global level as well. So uh, anything I can do to help, I know Farhan has been doing a lot of this. Uh, I'm a great admirer of Farhana. We've been working together uh, for many years. Uh, so I, I'm very happy to be here, happy to engage further and see what we can do together going forward. I'll stop there for now, Farhana. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Celine, for that excellent overview. Um, you are a true veteran of the negotiation and a stalwart in helping the, the powerful, those who have the ability to change and should have done more to account. So I'm really, really, you know, you're a great mentor and a friend and a buddy and an inspiration for us all to, to keep going. And, I, you know, maybe later on you can share what keeps you going, mm -hmm. you know, in the face of this frankly, dispiriting picture at times. I know I'm often asked that, that question on a personal level. How do you keep smiling? How do you keep going? How do you um, maintain um, equilibrium, uh, you know, when the frustrations are so high? As, as everybody uh, uh, now knows, you know, the climate issue is not a surprise. This isn't like a pandemic that sort of came almost from nowhere and took the world by surprise. Climate uh, um, uh, and what it could do was known and our scientists told us about it in great detail, in great tombs of reports, you know, for the last 35 years. And, you know, Salim and I have gone grey and participated as scientists in that. And I guess before we, before we turn to, to um, our, our next speaker, I guess I would underline something that you said, which is about the art sector. You know, I, I sort of summarise it like we need we need more storytellers than scientists right now. Uh, we need more creatives right now, not just to sort of graphically design stuff and communicate better, but to help us um, uh, use the, the language of the arts, which is, uh, you know, touches and speaks to uh, uh, many more emotions um, and, and to, to, to find responses to the anger, the hurt, the frustration, the climate anxiety, as well as the beauty and the joy that still exists in the world, as well as you know how we can imagine our way to a, to a much better future. So with that, I'm going to uh, be quiet because we're catching up on time as well. We started a few minutes late. Um, and uh, let me turn now and introduce um, Anna Santa Mauro, who is a curator, an educator, and a researcher on micropolitics and socially engaged art. She joined Art Catalyst in May 2017 and co-founded um, 
uh, a vessel in Bari in Italy, uh, somewhere where I've always wanted to go actually, but you know, we'll have to find a, a, a low carbon route to get there. So please tell us a little bit more about that. Um, uh, Santa Maria, uh, uh, Anna was also uh, ESP and program public programmer at Eastside Projects in Birmingham. And in 2017, 2018, she was curator in residence at Grand Union in Birmingham, where she curated um, a program called Osrara. Uh, she are also doing your PhD, as I understand it, at Wolverhampton. So over to you, Anna, and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. You have some slides, I think. Yes, I do. Thank you thank so you. much, Farhana, for the introduction. And thank you uh, to Julie Spicicle for, uh, for the kind invitation. Um, I guess in this five minutes intro that I will give, I will tell you a little bit about Arts Catalyst and the work that we do, and I will focus on two of our recent projects that seemed relevant for today, today's conversation. So we are an arts organization, a visual arts organization uh, and a charity. We were established in 1994. And two years ago, we relocated from London to Sheffield in Yorkshire in the UK. Uh, we commission artist projects, research inquiries, and public programs that exist at the intersections of art, health, ecology, and economics. And the way that we work is we bring artists together with communities, activists, and researchers from different disciplines. So today I will mainly focus on two projects, uh, right on the intertidal zone and test sites, but I will mainly expand on the latter because I've had more of a first-hand experience of, uh, of it. Uh, right on the intertidal zone uh, took place between 2014 and 2016, and um, it was developed in collaboration with uh, artists Joha, Frank Gallardo, Critical Art Ensemble, and uh, Andy Freeman. And the project was exploring the rapidly changing uh, eco-political context of the Thames estuary, uh, considered as a complex collection of objects, atmospheres, and flows that we believed could not be reduced to scientific methods and models. Uh, at the time, uh, there were new major infrastructures in, con in construction, including uh, the largest port con container port in the UK, a deep water port that is able to handle a biggest, the biggest container um, ships uh, in the world. Uh, the estuary is also uh, a site for critical wilderness, uh, for biodiversity conservation and species migration. And at the same time, it is um, a place of leisure and tourism um, with uh, a great heritage of fishing and uh, uh, historic wrecks. So it's a very complex, uh, um, it's, a, it's a very complex scenario. So the project brought together a network of local people with, with uh, artists and technologists to explore how local situated knowledge of the estuary could be combined with uh, artistic investigations and citizen science techniques to explore and respond to the changing contested estuary. Uh, the project had various uh, outcomes. I thought I'd mentioned gradient of a uh, lost species, which is uh, a monument or anti-monument developed by Yoha and Critical Art Ensemble, uh, which uh, was created from a local wreck, the Souvenir, which was a fishing boat, um, and that was reclaimed from the yesterday mud, so you can still go and visit it. Uh, during 2015 and 2016, the artists led a series of uh, inquiries and conversations with uh, local communities in Lyon C and South End uh, to gather knowledge and expertise around lost species, uh, be them wildlife, marine creatures, or even livelihoods, ways of saying uh, fishing methods and labor. Um, so everything that the local communities felt that they were losing. Um, and uh, the artist worked with uh, uh, local craftsmen uh, in order to laser cut all these different worlds on the vessel's surface. So this became uh, almost like a monument to the past and to the possible futures of, um, uh, of the Thames estuary and of these two particular um, uh, towns. Um, 
I thought it might be interesting also to mention one of our most recent projects, Test Sites, which is uh, a series of uh, inquiries into uh, issues connected to environmental change, such as flooding, pollution, and species loss, and how they impact on local culture and health and well being, both of humans and of non humans. We particularly focused on uh, the Calder Valley, which is located in West Yorkshire, where flooding and water pollution have been issues for uh, more than 20, uh, sorry, more than 200 years. We brought together uh, a group of artists, including Ruth Levine, Invisible Flock, Materology, together with uh, a medical anthropologist, uh, Megan Clinch, and the communities of humans and non-humans that uh, inhabit the Calder Valley and the wider catchment. So generally the project aimed at reimagining modes of caring and forms of stewardship of uh, those infrastructures that had been completely uh, broken and dismantled um, over the course of uh, the previous decades. Um, and so really thinking about how uh, do we look after for those infrastructures? How do we create new infrastructures that can sustain our existing damaged ecologies? The project was inspired by the notion of planetary health, uh, which in the definition provided by the Lancet Commission is, and I'm quoting, is based on the understanding that human health and human civilization depend on flourishing natural systems and the wise stewardship of those natural systems. So it's not just about um, understanding and recognizing this interconnectedness, but it is very much uh, about finding ways to caring for them and uh, uh, enacting forms of stewardship that are in dialogue with the natural systems themselves. Um, so also in this case, the, the project had many different outputs. Um, we uh, created a, uh, the artist Ruth Levine created uh, a 3D representation of the whole of the Calder catchment that was populated by a series of miniature scenes that represented uh, canal locks, flood defenses, um, uh, water sources, uh, sewage, all those components that uh, refer to the water system uh, locally and, and globally. Uh, and we invited members of the public to engage with these di different miniature scenes and to present uh, what they understand uh, the scenario, what they understand the future of the valley should look like by moving the scenes and putting them uh, in relation to each other in the way they thought it was necessary. So generally in the Calder Valley, we encountered uh, a very complex scenario and a fragmented valley uh, with uh, infrastructures that had been suffering from uh, years and years of austerity. And uh, at, at the time, what we found really difficult is to uh, even try to answer the questions, uh, who owns the water, who cares for the water, and who looks after the water. We, also encountered a number of caretakers of the valley uh, who have been practicing forms of stewardship and guardianship of the valley for many years. So we have been doing our best to honor and learn from those practices. And I guess just to um, end this brief introduction, uh, I believe that while the damage provoked by the floods was incredibly visible to the eye, we also recognized that those floods were the symptom of a slow process of loss, uh, the loss of any non-productive non and non-functional relationship with water, and the loss of um, the understanding of water and of the water system and the way it interconnects human and non-human life. Uh, so I believe I'll stop here and uh, maybe we can expand more in, in the questions. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much also for sharing your slides. And, and it's always a picture speaks a thousand words. So it was a, lovely to get a little glimpse of the way in which, you know, communities are, and artists are coming together to, to look at uh, many of these things and to co-create. Um, as we're running a little bit short of time, we'll come back and please use the chat function to put comments, reactions in the chat box. Uh, resources, you, you know, we're going to extract the, the resources um, and, and send them out to everyone from the chat function. So don't feel you have to save everything. I always do that. We get a bit like I've got to save all these things. 
Um, let me move on to um, the, our next speaker, and then we'll hopefully have a, a, a quite a bit of time to also come back to each of them with your comments and, and, and reactions. So I'm absolutely delighted to uh, welcome Andrea Carmen. Um, Andrea um, is uh, from the Yaki Nation and is one of the pioneers in really bringing forward and, and making sure that there is representation from indigenous peoples in, in all of the processes that we have and is really one of the, the founders of the, the, the legal framework and architecture for <clears throat> making sure that the, the UN system you know, respects uh, the rights of indigenous peoples. Um, she was uh, the uh, staff member at the International Indian Treaty Council back in 1983 um, and uh, also has uh, uh, formally addressed the UN General Assembly uh, and the Earth Summits along the way, many of the milestone summits. So I feel we must have crossed paths at some time, Andrea. Um, the indigenous peoples were reportedly at Glasgow, the second largest delegation. Uh, if you looked at all of the, the people who were registered, uh, second only to the fossil fuel industry. Um, and I hope uh, with yeah. your, apparently that's the case when um, an analysis was done um, if, if you added up all of those with fossil fuel industry, industry badges and uh, affiliations, um, but you were, you were only half the size of the fossil fuel industry, but I think you more than touched the hearts and minds and uh, I'm look, looking forward to hearing from you about um, this topic and what, where you think uh, we might go in the future. You're obviously also a crucial member of um, the, one of the big gains that Paris made in, in climate justice, actually, we forget that sometimes we've made all these gains, um, which was the local communities mm -hmm. and indigenous peoples platform, which I'd love to hear more uh, about. So Andrea, over to you. I think you have about five minutes and then I'll start waving to you, um, five or six minutes. So then we'll go to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chokwe Otesia, Leo Chaniao. Good morning, good evening um, to everybody who is participating. And I want to thank you, especially Julie's Bicycle, for inviting me to be part of this panel. We've gotten to know each other through our uh, mutual participation in the Climate Heritage Network. And I uh, encourage everybody who is listening um, to look into uh, being part of that very important network that's brought a lot of us together that otherwise might not know each other. Um, I'm going to be speaking, of course, as uh, a member representing North America Indigenous Peoples um, on the Local Communities Indigenous Peoples platform. But through um, that participation, I've also been a founding member of um, the Warsaw International Mechanism, um, NELS uh, expert group, which is non-economic loss and damage. And I'm really appreciative of their vision to include from the beginning Indigenous peoples in that discussion, uh, which is very important. I just wanted to show you a picture of uh, some loss and damage. This is our own family farm here in the Sonora Desert. I'm from the Yaqui Indigenous Nation, which is um, in southern Arizona, United States, and northern Mexico. Um, both. Uh, they ran that border through the middle of our country. And um, this was uh, from year before last, we had the hottest, driest summer ever recorded in the Sonora Desert. And these are natural uh, plants, um, cactuses called nopal, that is both food and medicine for us. It's healing, it's curative of diabetes, and you can see even as an indigenous plant, it's wilting and withering. This is not how they're supposed to look. And um, the losses to our food systems um, is uh, linked um, inextricably to the practice of our culture, our ways of knowing. And this is important to realize an important contribution that we make to this dialogue that for us, culture and the most practical day-to-day -day, uh, way of life uh, can't be separated. Next slide, please. I think you're changing from there, right?
And I appreciate that. Um, this is one uh, picture of the rights-based approach that we've been able to have affirmed uh, at the Local Communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform. It's kind of ironic because the UNFCCC, which was, of course, established back at the first Earth Summit in 1992, uh, for many, many years was one of the hardest for Indigenous peoples to have a voice in, even though the scientists were beginning to uh, recognize in their reports that we were among the most affected, the frontline communities. And these are just two examples um, of forced relocation that's actually taking place, uh, not only losing homelands like in Shishmaref, Alaska and Tuvalu in the Pacific Ocean, but losing cultural identity as well as our right to self-determination. What happens when uh, independent, sovereign, indigenous peoples are forced to become refugees? Who are they then? Um, what about their ancestral identity is something I think that needs to be considered and maybe unique for us. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, this is taking longer. Um, of course, the, the 2015 Paris decision recognized finally uh, the value and the importance of indigenous people's knowledge and practices, uh, and also decided to create a platform for exchange of best practices um, within the UNFCCC system. So finally, we had a um, formal participation from inside uh, the UNFCCC. We've had uh, an Indigenous Peoples Caucus for many, many years, for decades, in fact, but um, now we have both an um, independent caucus and a formal body at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change to voice um, and share the knowledge and perspectives and also to uh, support the consideration of the rights of Indigenous peoples in the context of climate change. Next slide, please. Sorry, it's taking a little bit of time, evidently. Um, this is one of the basis of our work, Article 31 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, that affirms that Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop our cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, cultural expressions, as well as our sciences, our knowledge of plants and animals. Um, this is a... Uh, Hopi young farmer showing how the roots of the corn in a place where um, all of um, the plants are grown by rainfall, there's no uh, springs, there's no groundwater ir irrigation, that knowledge of the corn of how to um, produce a root that goes way down deep into the soil um, is a teaching and, and a cultural way of knowing for indigenous peoples. We can learn from the seeds as well about adaptation. Next slide. One of the biggest um, advances I think for us at COP26 was for the first time the UNF Triple C recognized uh, 28 indigenous knowledge holders, four from each of the seven biocultural regions for indigenous peoples, including women and youth. I was one of the co-leads of this activity and we brought all of the knowledge holders together. Only four uh, decided to participate virtually and the rest were there in person um, to come together to share our statements and perspectives and knowledge with each other in a closed meeting first and then in a meeting with the states. And this is a picture of the indigenous members of the facilitative working group of the LSIP and also the indigenous uh, knowledge holders that attended. Next slide, please. I want to share for this discussion um, the perspectives on knowledge uh, of the knowledge holders on loss and damage. Um, and I, I'm going to read this. This is the only one I'm really reading from. But um, I, I hope that um, you can hear this. Uh, the seasons we have always known are changing and the weather is more extreme and unpredictable. Due to the changing climate, we are seeing new animals, insects, fish, plants, and birds coming into our territories. Some are invasive, 
push out the indigenous species, destroy original biodiversity and forests, and carry disease. At the same time, many of those we have always depended on are disappearing. We are experiencing droughts, flooding, forest fires, rising sea levels, and melting ice, threatening the productivity and life cycles of our lands, waters, and food sources. Our rivers and lakes are drying up, and we cannot drink the water anymore. The loss and damage we have suffered from the impacts of climate change is already extreme and is both economic and non-economic and directly affects knowledge systems and ways of life. While no price can be put on what we have already lost and all that is threatened, adequate direct financial resources would greatly assist indigenous communities to adapt to these losses, restore what we can and protect and strengthen the resiliency of what remains. And this statement was presented there at the COP to the states, um, at, which was attended by many, many state parties, as well as um, the presidency from Great Britain. Next slide. And I'm just finishing here. Um, I want to say thank you very much. Um, this is uh, a picture of one of the most important aspects for our own adaptation, mitigation, and solutions is our elders working with our youth and children to understand our relationships that need to be strengthened in order to uh, provide for our survival in the future. Choco Tessia, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Andrea. Thank you so much for all that you've been doing for decades. Um, you know, I, I, going back to this question of what sustains us, how can we keep going in the face of uh, injustice and the many um, now inbuilt impacts that are facing uh, frontline communities and uh, especially indigenous people who have been at the forefront of resistance to many of the practices. I, I really want to thank you hugely and to, to express my gratitude always to, to what you've done. Um, I think we have around uh, a half an hour um, for our panelists uh, who've come back. I hope you can all see them. Um, uh, I think we were having, um, I'm not sure people are using the questions and answers box. It's quite difficult uh, to, 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 to read through all the brilliant um, comments. So if you do have questions specifically, please do put them in there. In the meantime, I'll, I'll ask some of my own. And uh, Salim, as you're, I know, an intersectional, uh, uh, you know, climate justice guy, I'm going to uh, ask a couple of questions to Anna and Andrea to give them a bit of parity uh, in terms of speaking time, because uh, I had slightly less. Um, and you're such a gentleman, I know that you won't mind that. And uh, please do chime in, though, um, at, at the end. I think, Anna, one of the things that we're all grappling with is, you know, the projects that you shared are very site specific. They're very local. Um, so one is about how they came about uh, a little bit, a short, a short abbreviated, I guess, uh, maybe what, where the inspiration and the, the momentum came from. But also, how does that tie up then with this very big, uh, set of processes that we have, you know, tying up the local with the the the, the macro, the global. That's the uh, one of the questions that uh, everyone grapples with and asks. So that's my question to you, um, and I'll I'll ask Andrea as well, but uh, to give you a little bit of a heads up, and so I don't have to keep uh, interrupting. It would be it would be great if you could also talk a little bit about how there's a loss of physical heritage sites. Obviously, many processes. Uh, are underway that are depleting and encroaching on, on lands, but it would be great if you could uh, talk a little bit about, um, uh, you know, intangible uh, aspects like land, uh, culture, languages, uh, and so forth. You touched on that a little bit already, so just a, a little bit more of an elaboration. So over to you, Anna, first. Thank you for the question. Um, I guess maybe I need to look back uh, at the history of Alts Catalyst, which, uh, as I said, has uh, 27 years uh, of history in itself, uh, and mention that um, I, th I think around 15 years ago, uh, the work of the organization became more and more embedded and focused on, let's say, matters of concern that were equally important to artists, to scientists, and most importantly, to communities. Um, and this 
shift happened in particular in relation to a project called the Arctic Perspective Initiative that uh, saw the organization uh, become part of this collective um, uh, inquiry around the changing environment of the Arctic. Uh, and uh, the project was led by Marco Pelian and Matthew Biedermann. And they were working very closely with uh, architects and scientists um, in, uh, uh, in the Arctic uh, in order to develop open source monitoring and sensing models um, that could be shared with uh, local communities. But the project happened in very close dialogue with uh, uh, indigenous communities in uh, Nunavut in Canada. And uh, in a way, I think through this process, it became very clear to the organization, to us, that a different model of collaborative work needed to happen that could move away from um, you know, extractive approaches towards local knowledges and local communities, and that instead could be rooted in the situated knowledges that the communities have. Um, what we found uh, over the years is that very often communities are approached both by scientists, uh, artists, and uh, um, uh, and potentially even activists uh, in, some, in, in, in this form of consultation model rather than um, through an actual cooperation. And so we, we really wanted to move away from from this kind of approach and develop a different way of working that could put like the situated knowledge at the very core. And so we were keen on bringing this way of working in the UK, in particular at a time when test sites started in 2017, uh, when the, the, the public debate was completely flattened by uh, leaving the, you know, the conversation around leaving the EU. Um, but at the same time, we could witness that there were um, you know, this, the signs of environmental change happening in different parts of the country. So floods in West Yorkshire, but also incredible levels of uh, air uh, pollution in, in London and, and so on. Um, so we felt that it was, necessary for us as an organization who has always been very active in the field of environmental change to uh, embed ourselves uh, outside of London and to embed ourselves uh, in these communities that were actually ex experiencing environmental change and to uh, start these very slow and long-term relationships um, that could help us understand what were the urgencies and what were the questions, what were the needs that those communities were uh, encountering. And at the same time, we were very interested in what was already happening uh, locally. Uh, and so, as I mentioned in my introduction, really uh, creating alliances and building conversations with uh, caretakers of the valley, of with people who for years have been recognizing that, you know, the, the, the environmental crisis would exacerbate and uh, would affect uh, everyone. Um, and very briefly on the question around, um, you know, these global challenges, I think uh, we, are, we have always been incredibly keen on um, uh, combining the hyperlocal with the planetary and thinking about planetary health as a, a, a holding concept for, for the project was, was very important because it, it allowed us to uh, expand on those interconnected dimensions uh, between uh, the human and the non-human, but also it allowed us to really think beyond administrative boundaries and nation borders and engage people in, in, in conversations around uh, those questions. Thank you, and over to you, Andrea. So uh, a little Thank bit you. more of an expansive answer on that question of the loss of you know, not, not just uh, uh, climate impacts such as wildfires and biodiversity loss and damaged environments, but on the cultural dimensions and how you're dealing with that and what would be your priorities in, in, in asking this audience, those in the global north, those in the arts community uh, for support and help? I think the core perspective that we can bring to the table that is, of course, a day-to-day -day way of life for Indigenous peoples is that um, humans are not separate from nature. You know, I've been on panels about water and water conservation, water restoration. Indigenous peoples are reviving methods um, from um, time immemorial to save water and to 
to irrigate without, you know, using any water that's piped in, even here in the desert. But, you know, to remind us that we are water. We're each and every person listening here is mainly made of water. We aren't separate from nature. And we aren't separate from the natural world. And if humans can quit seeing themselves as something distinct, that's why indigenous peoples have not gotten um, on board very broadly with terminology like uh, nature-based solutions, uh, rights of nature, um, green economy, you know, protected areas, all of these things. In fact, some of them are really being used against us um, and against the rights of indigenous peoples, um, that we can bring this relationship um, with the natural world um, that is the basis of our way of life and culture as well, very practical, as well as the basis for our, our ceremonies and cultural practices uh, to the world arena and help to make that shift in the mentality of the state parties and others. And we see it happening, um, especially at this last COP when we had our knowledge holders, our elders and youth, um, they're talking about these things, our traditional food producers. Um, you can tell when someone's just kind of check, checking the box. Oh yeah, okay, indigenous peoples, we heard from them. Now let's hear from youth or women or you know the next category. Suddenly the states are really listening to us. We kind of joke among ourselves. They must be really scared if they're finally coming to indigenous peoples to say, wait, what do you know that we can use? And I think even it, you know here in the United States, it's becoming so costly for the states to deal with these disasters one by one. They're spending billions of dollars every time there's a hurricane or tornado or fire or flood that are all caused by climate change. They're finally, I think, ready to listen to us and ready to listen um, and realize that indigenous peoples have something to offer these discussions from a very fundamental basis. And you say, why do we keep, you know, banging our head against the wall? We have to. Anybody who has children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews or community members that are young and their children, you know, we have to try. We have a responsibility and not only a right to be at this table. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, um, everything you say I could, you know, amplified comment on but there are now lots of questions coming in in the question and answer box and to make the best use of the the 20 minutes or so that we have and getting as many perspectives I'm going to turn this into a rapid response mode so no more uh, uh five minutes I'm going to turn on my one minute answer so um uh you all have all three of you jump in um maybe starting with Celine. I can ask you, um, Hannah Lee Chalk has asked, um, how can we shift from individual level actions, which are important, but often induce a bit of guilt and make us feel quite small in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, the effort that we're putting into the change that we're getting. How do we move that towards collective learning? And what are you doing in response to that? Uh, so starting off with Salim, when I'm putting the timer yeah. on, so, uh, when, I'll, it, I'll, when it flips, you're going to be, you know, passing on to the next person, or the next person jumps in. Thank you. Okay, I'll I'll be brief. A quick answer for me uh, is for every one of us now on the planet uh, to think of ourselves first as planetary citizens, and only second as citizens of a country, or even citizens of a city or a town. That is now a second order uh, identity. The first order identity is planetary citizenship. And that means we need to look at problems like climate change at a planetary scale and link with uh, friends and people, like-minded people across the globe. And to me, you know, the COP26 event in Glasgow wasn't important for what the leaders did inside the blue zone, but what the indigenous people and the youth and everybody else was doing outside in the city of Glasgow linking from all over the world, thousands of us, that to me was by far the bigger achievement and something to celebrate that we were able to do. And now with technology, we can do it, you know, virtually as well as we're doing right now. Uh, let us see if we can connect better uh, as citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anna, would you like to jump in? 
Yeah, very quickly, I'm uh, completely on the same page on, on the idea of uh, being citizens of, of the planet and really think that I really think that uh, it's important. Everyone has got responsibility, so everyone should do whatever is possible in order to uh, limit our impact. But it is also true that um, being aware on the one hand of uh, the practices and the modes of organization that are already into place and there's a lot going on and there's a lot to learn from uh, communities across uh, the planet. Uh, so being aware of what is already happening and uh, connecting as much as possible. And then there's, you know, part of me that also think uh, that, you know, being aware of who and should be held accountable is also a, a very important part of, of my answer, I guess, and recognizing what the causes of loss and damage are uh, who is more responsible than, than others uh, and, um, you know, bearing that in mind when uh, we can act as a citizen of a country. So like voting and participating. Um, Andrew, please feel free to answer that question. And also in, in the questions, there was a, a, a question about cultural appropriation and, you know, allyship and what, what can be done by others to, to make sure that Indigenous people are able to tell their stories as well, as well if you feel that there's something more to be done? Sure. Um, I think that in this particular situation, um, the alliances that we're building and renewing among Indigenous peoples, but also um, with uh, non-Indigenous networks like the Climate Heritage Network and, of course, others, those that attend the COP, is, is really vital. We can't just dig in, even though we need to do that as well. Indigenous peoples, um, we've been able to, to facilitate uh, revitalizing our original um, trade of seeds, you know, drought resistant seeds, seeds that grow very quickly. And these are natural seeds, you know, not, not genetically modified uh, among Indigenous peoples because our climates are changing. Um, we have a network locally in Arizona, but also throughout the hemisphere and beyond, you know, where we bring Indigenous peoples together to revitalize that sharing and trading that we've always done. And we also you know, have similar things um, outside. I think it's important and one of, the reason, one of the criteria that we had for even being willing to enter into this new platform um, at the UNFCCC was that our knowledge be safeguarded and that we have a rights-based safeguards because we also have been victims of what we call extractive research as well as extractive industries. Um, and we don't want to have that, you know, be repeated. So um, we do have um, rights safeguards in place, which goes hand in hand with our ability and willingness uh, as knowledge holders to share uh, what we know. And this has been very important. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I guess, uh, you know, a question that I'm picking up, I think, from, from David uh, Somerwell, um, a little bit elaborated it. Can you give me one concrete cultural intervention that has been really inspirational for you? Either you, don't be shy if you're involved in it and it's your own, you know, please, please say that, or someone else's. And also an example where something uh, where the cultural sort of sector or that an intervention was like, frankly, greenwashing. I know we're not, I don't mean you have to call out, but just a, a generic example, because I'm seeing a lot of both actually uh, in, 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 in work that I come across. I'd be very excited, um, interested to, to hear from you. So maybe go, uh, would you like to go first again, Celine, or should we, should we ask, uh, uh, Andrea to go first no. this time. Andrea can go first. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting that in indigenous languages, we don't have really a word for culture. I think that's important. We don't have a word for human rights either. Um, if we talk about responsibilities, uh, is how you'd say it in Yaki, the people's duty to the creator, which includes keeping our ceremonies, our language, you know, our songs and dances going, but also, you know, fighting when we need to, to defend our rights, um, how we treat each other on a day-to-day -day basis, 
and how we act in the world and how we interact with the created world, with the natural world. So all of these things are really together. One concrete example, I think, um, and I presented this to actually a, a NELS committee meeting about cultural heritage and water uh, was in Hawaii, where, as we all know, you know, they were illegally annexed by the United States, um, a huge tourist site. Uh, the, whole, the highest homeless level is among the actual native Hawaiians there. Uh, but they, um, on the nation of Hawaii, on the land they were able to regain, they removed the invasive species, eucalyptus trees from Australia, which used is a large amount of water. They removed those, chopped them up and used them for planters and houses and things and beginning to restore their native taro plants that use, you know, the, the water beds all naturally, all from their indigenous watershed. So their cultural relationship with the taro um, is the same as their food system, is the same as asserting their rights and restoring their natural biodiversity. These things can't be separated for indigenous yeah. peoples. Thank you. Well, that's, that's wonderful. And, and, and Anna, I, I think that that point needs reinforcing again and again myself that many of these uh, separations of, uh, you know, started actually only a few hundred years ago and they're very much tied to uh, the fundamental physical and philosophical concepts that came with the enlightenment, you know, mind and body, you know, uh, politics versus culture, society versus civil society. So all of these structures and underlying units don't even make sense for maybe where we need to go next. So over to you, Anna. And when you hear the buzzer, you know, feel free to slightly expand if you haven't finished your sentence. But this one, one, one minute rule is makes you a little bit more uh, succinct. Uh, and tweetable um, and, and please keep your questions coming we'll go to about 10 past if that's okay with everyone. I'm not sure I've got uh, in mind an example uh, of uh, greenwashing because I tend to I think it's like a defense mechanism I tend to remove them <laughs> but I think maybe some um, projects that I would like to to mention uh, I think artists are doing some artists are doing great work and I would wanted to mention um, Rachel O'Reilly's work. I don't know how uh, familiar uh, you are, but uh, Rachel O'Reilly's a uh, poet and an artist uh, uh, and a curator and she and a filmmaker. She uh, developed this work, film work called Infractions uh, in collaboration with Kukani and a large group of indigenous activists from the Northern Territories in Australia who are, have been leading the struggle against um, gas fr shale gra gas uh, fracking uh, in um, uh, in the area and uh, the way what i particularly admire about the project is uh, the, the the possibility for an artwork to become a platform and to become like this expansive uh, network that supports campaigns uh, activists and groups that have been doing the work for many years so honoring that uh, knowledge and uh, providing a platform for that knowledge is really really important and artists are, re are great at doing that i think Thank you. And over, over to you, Celine, you don't get off the hook, you know, what's been <laughs> a great, you know, what, you were there for almost three weeks in Glasgow, so um, it would be great to hear from you. What was the... Sure. Yeah, so let let me example. let me give you sort of a, a different take on, on your broad question that you asked. To me, there are, uh, the climate change problem has very significant and powerful enemies. You know, it is being created knowingly. 30 years ago, they were off the hook. They didn't know. Now they know and they're still doing it. The polluters, the big polluting companies, the fossil fuel companies, they are absolutely uh, uh, knowingly causing harm and profiting from causing harm. And they have also bought politicians uh, to do their bidding. Uh, and that's very clear as well. And so they cannot be given a seat at the table. They cannot be given any kind of, you know, gestures of goodwill. Yes, you know, invite them to talk to us. They are the enemy. They are the criminals. We have to fight them. And that's really something that, you know, the, the justice angle of, you know, this is wrong. And there are criminals doing wrong that need to be addressed and need to be fought. This is not a neutral territory anymore. 
I have an example of greenwashing really quickly. And that's, that's that whole um, net zero that's all popular now to talk about. What does net zero really mean? You know, what, what are we trading? What's the carbon trading issue around this net zero um, issue? Who's suffering at the other end of what's being traded? And just to add one more thing, one of my favorite people, a very well-known indigenous economist, one of the few I know, said that anytime you put a market price on anything, the motivation is to make more of it, not less. Mm -hmm. So you have some trade, right? So this whole false, you know, carbon trading, net zero, I think we have to really challenge it and not just accept these cool sounding words like nature based solutions is another example. Sorry for interjecting. No, no, I think, uh, well, I want to use my chair's uh, uh, prerogative to, uh, you know, behind me, some of you may recognize that's the, the sign for ecocide. And uh, it's true that, you know, we all need to act on climate change, but actually some of us needed to have acted a lot sooner and mm -hmm. others actually deliberately went out of the way to, to, to stop climate action from happening. And those are, I think I agree with, you know, Celine, the people who need to be held to account. So in the art sector, it's unconscionable to take money from those who are engaging actively in climate denial, climate delay, and sponsoring, for example, you know, the fossil fuel industry has long sponsored, uh, long sponsored as a deliberate another strategy to, you know, arts organizations, big and small everywhere. So I feel like uh, artists need to speak up uh, uh, themselves and however uncomfortable and difficult the budget equations look personally and for your institutions, that is uh, an absolutely unacceptable, I think, uh, support being given by this by this sector and it is starting to grapple with that it's starting to grapple with the way in which those who deliberately caused knowingly caused I should say the climate crisis that is impacting the vulnerable so that's my own tuppence worth as as chair and I wish I had been far more active in in pursuing the culprits and that that's why, you know, I, I glued myself to Shell, for example, <laughs> three years ago, because actually, you know, we were making great speeches, events, doing cultural as well as, you know, negotiations. And in the meantime, billions were still still being poured into very deliberate attempts to, to do otherwise. Um, I think um, let me let me have a look. I'm, I'm only looking at the questions box. So if you're if you're sticking stuff on the chat function, please put it in the in the in the in the questions um, box, uh, if you like, because it's very difficult to switch to one thing or another. I guess my, my uh, takeaway, really, uh, my last question before we wrap up, and it will be one minute each, you know, you'll hear the buzzer on my phone, um, is what next? What next for the creative sector who are really listening to, to this podcast? Um, what, what is your one ask? You know, what is your one pointy ask? Uh, and and, and can, you, can you say who should do it, you know, as well? well be be more, more, more bold and specific and courageous. So starting off with Anna, I think. Well, I, I want to echo what you were just uh, mentioning, Farhana, um, in relation to, you know, being very much aware of uh, who funds uh, you as an organization, as an artist, I completely uh, agree with you and it's one of uh, our uh, key policies as, as a small organization. Um, and um, yes, I believe that uh, the, the net, what, what is necessary is really to um, make sure that the arts keep providing that space for, you know, um, calling out who is creating damage, uh, uh, creating alliances and uh, supporting campaigns that are specifically addressing those who are um, suffering from uh, environmental, um, uh, from damage and, and the loss. Thank you. Um, Andrea? Yes, again, I think, you know, we need to um, challenge these false distinctions. 
I will give just one example that was really important to us. When we were in Glasgow, the mayor of Glasgow came to the Indigenous Caucus, our preparatory meeting before the COP started, and said that they realized that the appropriation, because Glasgow was a major port to the Americas and the import of a lot of um, products from the Americas during the colonial times, that they also had appropriated many cultural and sacred items from Indigenous peoples. And he said, you know, even though it doesn't seem like it's linked to climate change, they realize it is that they were opening their doors of their museums to indigenous peoples to see if there were items in their museums that shouldn't be there, that should be part returned, repatriated to our communities to improve our resiliency spiritually and, and physically. So this is just one example of some of the alliances and some of the links we're making that are going beyond thinking outside the box about solutions. Thank you. Thank you. And over to you, Celine, before I do okay. a housekeeping. <clears throat> sure. Uh, so just picking up on that last uh, point from Andrea, I would encourage everybody here to engage with the Scottish government who have created the first loss and damage fund. You know, at the beginning of COP, uh, the first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, put a million pounds on the table, challenged other leaders to match it. Uh, she got some uh, matching. We got the province of Wallonia and Belgium uh, put in a million euros, a number of foundations put money in. Fahana was very instrumental in getting that happen. And then she added another million at the very end. And, and they are actually looking for allies and people to fund. So, you know, uh, knock on their door and see uh, what you might be able to contribute. I'm sure you'll get a good hearing from them. The other offer I'd like to make is for uh, the uh, audience here, who I'm assuming are mainly uh, British or European, uh, to connect with people in Bangladesh. We have a very, very active artistic community, creative community in my country, Bangladesh. I'd be very happy to connect you to them. And as I said, we need to be thinking globally. You do act locally, but also act lo globally and connect across the world, wherever you may have connections with, uh, make those connections. And it does add value in my view to do those connections. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Liam. You know, um, I want to also thank the Scottish government who also met with the indigenous mm -hmm. uh, uh, groups ahead of the COP and engaged actually in a number of ceremonial uh, uh, welcomings uh, uh, and took part and Nicola Sturgeon, you know, met with the, the Minga people many times and also agreed to pass on their demands for climate justice. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, the, the cultural ways in which we can bring politicians as well uh, to lead with their heart is very, very important. Um, now, some little apologies to all of those whose questions we did not get to. Uh, question net zero, maybe a JB uh, uh, needs uh, to, to have a, a special one on that. I think we all need to uh, see what are the advantages as well as the way in which this concept is, is creating uh, a, a platform for greenwashing rather than action. Um, as I mentioned, um, a huge thank you first and foremost to Julie's Bicycle for convening this. A huge thank you to Anna, Andrea, Salim for decades of work. Uh, sorry, there's a lot more to do still. You cannot retire. <laughs> um, and as I said, this uh, is a, a part of a a series of webinars that's being run by Julie's Bicycle exploring themes related to climate justice and what is uh, the challenge to the art sector. The art sector is also one of the richest sectors in terms of philanthropy. Climate philanthropy is just 2% of, uh, <laughs> of the total. The art sector has a lot more, even though you may not in this call think I'm getting any of it, but you know, it is a very, very well endowed sector and has uh, uh, a presence literally in every high street and every school, you know, you reach through your, uh, whether it's school productions to, to, to plays, to poems, to music, to film, to arts. So you have an enormous uh, uh, leverage as, as we like to call it. So please uh, tune in to the different uh, things that Julie's Bicycle is trying to do with this sector, follow them on social media, use the hashtag uh, creative climate justice. And if you'd like to hear more about their work, please, uh, tune into the podcast, The Colour Green, and the film series, uh, um, The Colour Green, in conversation at the Grand Junction in, in London. We'll be sending out the resources that people shared in the chat uh, uh, later on to, to everyone and making those available publicly. So um, 
please do, if you have a minute, type them in. And a recording of uh, this event will be available also on the website of Julie's Bicycle um, uh, shortly. So um, allow me to now just really express my heartfelt thanks to each and every one of you for joining for an hour and a quarter, for staying the course, for being so interactive, and to uh, join me in, in giving a virtual clap or using your you know, reactions buttons or saying one word in the chat function of what you found inspiring or a takeaway. So one word, the waterfall, uh, away you go. And, 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 and thank you all again. Okay, so excellent. Wow, well, nice, nice, um, nice thank yous to you all. Well, you are brilliant. What a fantastic panel.